All right, thanks everybody for still staying until the final panel. I know it's a very full day with a lot of content, but we're also very happy to have this final panel because this is a reflection on the conference we did back in June called AI Traps Automating Discrimination. And in this panel, we want to reflect a bit further on this, this conference and the topic. And I'm happy to introduce the moderator of this panel, which is Ruth Catlow. Um, she's an artist and co-founder and co-director together with Mark Garrett of a space called Furtherfield, which is the UK's leading organization for art, labs, and debates around critical questions in art and technology uh, since 1996. Uh, Cat Ruth Catlow co-curates programs developed to make network cultures more feelable and accessible to more diverse people. Uh, and the exhibitions and labs of Furtherfield also tour nationally and internationally, and they focus on strengthening the expressive and emancipatory potential of digital technology. So thank you, Ruth, for being with us today to moderate this panel. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at the uh, Disruption Network Lab, and especially for the kind of first gathering of the community activation. Um, we're really excited by the, yeah, we're really excited by this kind of new development at the Disruption Network Lab to put so much focus on uh, connection and elaborating on what happens in the conferences in a community setting. It feels like a really wonderful progression. Um, I'm just going to go, oh no, I'm not going to go back. Can I only go forward? I can only go forward. Okay. Um, Yes, so this session is called, it kind of builds on the Disruption Network Lab's previous conference uh, around, around AI and AI traps. And this one's called uh, AI Traps and Possible Escapes. And we have uh, two people in conversation with me on this panel. So Caroline, Caroline Sinders is going to talk on the labor behind AI systems and uh, kind of approaches to making it more equitable. And uh, Sarah Grant is looking at social justice is issues around access control in networked environments. And we were, we were kind of talking about the fact that neither Sarah or I feel like kind of confident AI specialists, but we are both, I think, have long practice in the networked environments in which AIs are produced and live. And uh, so this, this conversation is about both the AIs and the context in which they live and the communities of humans that sit around them, how they're affected and kind of what, what actions are currently being taken. Um, I'm going to introduce you both a little more fully, but I wanted to say a little more about myself, just so you understand where my questions are coming from. Yeah, so uh, I'm co-founder of Furtherfield. We run this gallery in the heart of a park in North London called Finsbury Park. Um, I'm going to keep this very brief. Um, our philosophies and approaches kind of, uh, they focus on playful, collaborative art research experiences, always across distance and difference enabled by networks. We focus on co-creational models, always looking at ways to disrupt network power of tech and culture. Uh, a focus really on, on engaging with the urgent debates of our time and making these debates uh, accessible and landing with more diverse people than the elite cultures normally associated with art especially. And the work we've done has kind of evolved alongside free and open source software cultures and theories and practices of the commons. Um, I thought I'd just point you at this project so you can, to give you a sense of how we've been thinking about approaches to algorithmic justice, which I think are again relevant to AI, questions of AI justice. So this is a program that we're currently involved in uh, called Algorithmic Food Justice. And it's a demonstration of uh, this, uh, our approach, which is, which is about putting culture before structure. So we would always assert that you want to put human organization, human need, or 
the needs of other living beings and living systems at the heart of your design for te technological systems. And I think a lot of the things we've looked at today, a lot of things we've heard about today, is actually about systems that are designed to make money or designs to optimize systems to become faster. And for this, we were looking at two uh, examples of injustice in global food system, one around access to food and the other around environmental degradation and species decline. And so a way of getting at the kind of human value flows in this uh, system was to work with a local community farm to run a series of mapping workshops around users, assets and values, and then to run a long live action role play where we all played uh, humans with our companion species in a future in which London is a city farm ran, run for uh, food commons and sustainable relationships with a kind of multi-species uh, social systems. So it's this way of kind of like doing quite complex things with very diverse people in a way that is fun. Um, and one of the things that we're, I think we're asking today is if AI and algorithms reinforce the prejudices and biases of human creators and societies, how do we fight discrimination and injustice now and into the future. And from my work at Furtherfield, uh, informed by Ostrom, Federici and Waring, we, I think we're looking at these kind of three uh, principles, which is culture before structure, always account for the care work, and value ecologies of care. And this is really about understanding always the, the things that happen happen on the ground. They might feel like they happen in abstract space, but they're happening on the ground and they're always affecting something on the ground. Okay. So the Disruption Network Lab uh, that has kind of set us up for this uh, focused on that, how the design of concrete applications of data science, machine learning, and algorithmic, uh, algorithms reflect, reinforce, and automate current and historical biases and inequalities of society. It looked at how they impact everyday life, as well as culture, politics, institutions, and behavior, reflecting inequalities based on social, racial, and gender prejudices. Um, so hopefully that gives us some kind of scene to jump into. Now, before I introduce uh, Caroline, I just want you to have it kind of like have your brain switched on about what good questions are. Please kind of be preparing questions because this is a really great setting. We have an opportunity to dive into some quite difficult topics, I think, and uh, we want to hear, we want the conversation to be with you, not with ourselves. So, Caroline. Uh, Caroline's a machine learning design researcher and artist. For the past few years, she's been focusing on the intersections of natural language processing, artificial intelligence, abuse, online harassment, and politics in digital conversational spaces. Uh, she's a founder of Convocation Design and Research, a design and research agency focusing on the intersections of machine learning, user research, designing for public good, and solving communication difficult problems. As a designer and researcher, she's worked with groups like Amnesty International, Intel, IBM Watson, the Wikimedia Foundation, and many others. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Caroline Sanders. Thank you for the introduction, Ruth. Um, this is a new talk that I've just made. So I'll be reading from some notes. And I'm going to start talking a little bit about labor. And I promise that it will tie into artificial intelligence, as well as maybe new ways of looking at bias in AI. So what you're seeing is a screenshot of a talk uh, that Lewis, uh, Lewis Hyman, a labor and uh, workers historian, gave at Data and Society a couple of months ago about technology and workers in New York City. He, uh, he's looking at the history of labor to contextualize what's happening right now, specifically with the gig economy. He says in this talk, when people talk about regular work, um, 
they talk as if the old economy was good, as if the world of W-2s and this new kind of work is bad, as if traditional work was this better work. He says, for so many people, that old economy is still actually bad work. It's the insecurity of slinging lattes, of being a greeter at Walmart. This distinction we draw is really important. It's this distinction that is the foundation of technological exceptionalism and the ways we think of this new economy, because technology is central to the story that is being told about our economy today. He also continues that there's this misconception that exists right now that technology drives social change and there's nothing we can do about it. So what he's really saying is technology isn't new, it updates society all the time. And Hyman argues we're going through this sort of second industrious revolution right now. The first one where workers were already primed, uh, the first one primed workers who were already working inside of factories that they were somewhat used to being surveilled. But now, what happens now? And really, what does this have to do with AI? There's the GIF. And I think it has to do a lot with machine learning. And let's just take a look, sort of high level, briefly, at a machine learning sort of standard pipeline. And what do we see here? We start with data preparation, feature extraction. Then we go into this one big section where we look at model training, testing data, creating the model. And that goes over and over and over again towards predictions. Well, if we're going through this new industrious age, we need to talk about how humans and human labor becomes hidden inside of automation, but still is integral to that. And in this slide, in this section, when we look at model uh, data modeling and training, that's all humans. Humans train models. We actually can't automate people out of that process at all. Humans can prepare and collect data, but humans have to train and test data models. So AI is very much about humans and human processes. Human hands touched almost every part of the pipeline. And those human hands make decisions about how AI happens. This is a photograph by Yang Song for the New York Times. It's of workers at the headquarters of Rujin Technology Company in Jianxin in central China's uh, Henan province. What they're doing is that they're identifying objects and images to help train artificial intelligence systems make sense of the world. What they're doing is paid labor, and this labor is a little similar to, or actually pretty similar to Mechanical Turk, which is also used to train AI systems. So we have this new kind of systematized factory job, but generally this labor does fall under the gig economy, which sort of brings us back to Hyman's talk at Data and Society. A major platform is used across the world to train data models, and that's Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And a lot of people who train data models are underpaid and are unseen inside of this process, which brings us to this art project of mine called Feminist Data Set. Feminist Data Set operates in a similar vein to Thomas Twait's Toaster Project, a critical design project in which Twait builds a commercial toaster from scratch, from melting iron ore to building circuits and creating a new plastic toaster or body mold. Feminist Data Set, however, takes uh, a critical and artistic view on software, particularly on machine using machine learning by using intersectional feminism as a framework for auditing and critiquing artificial intelligence systems. So what does it mean to thoughtfully make in machine learning to carefully consider every angle of making, iterating, and designing? Every step of the process has to be thoroughly re-examined through this new feminist lens, and much like the way it's toaster, every step has to actually work. Currently, within the project, we've just been gathering data through workshops. The next step is looking at addressing data training and data modeling. So in machine learning, when it comes to labeling, creating a data model, a lot of groups will generally use Amazon's uh, Mechanical Turk to label that data. And Amazon recre uh, created Mechanical Turk to sort of solve their own machine learning problems at scale. They needed large data sets trained and modeled, and they needed people to do it. Using Mechanical Turk is extremely standard in the field. It's used everywhere from technology companies to research groups to artists to help label data. So for feminist data set, the question is, is Mechanical Turk a feminist system? Is using a platform of gig economy ethical, equitable? Is it feminist? Is it intersectional? A system that creates competition among, amongst label, la, uh, laborers sorry, laborers who are also labelers, that discourages a union, that pays pennies per, per repetitive task, that creates nameless and hidden labor, is not ethical, nor is it feminist. So currently, as a part of a fellowship with the Mozilla Foundation, I am imagining and building what an ethical mechan mechanical Turk system could look like, one that is created from an intersectional feminist lens that could be used by research groups, individuals, maybe at some point, companies. 
The system will be ethical in the sense that it will allow for more transparency in who trains and labels a data set. The trainers will be called authors. The system will save data about the data set. The system will also give researchers and project creators the ability to see how much one trainer has trained the data, as well as invite and verify new trainers. Additionally, project creators will be able to pay trainers through um, this calculator we're, we're building that's uh, pushing tasks be, uh, closer or beyond living wage payments. Um, I'm gonna skip down because I know that I'm running behind on time. So making must be thoughtful and critical in order to, cre to create equity. It must be open to feedback and interpretation. We must understand that the role of data creation and how systems can use and misuse and benefit from data. Data must be seen as something created from communities and a reflection of that community, and data ownership is key within that. Data's position inside of technology, the technology systems is political, it's activated, and it's intimate. For there to be equity inside of machine learning, every aspect of the system needs to be examined, taken apart, and then put back together. It needs to integrate the realities, context, and constraints of all different kinds of people, not just the ones who built the early web. Technology needs to reflect those that are on the web now. So to create a feminist AI, interrogating labor in data, in data training systems like Mechanical Turk is key, to, is key, and looking at their governance systems is also very key to this. So the text on the slide, for example, it's talking about a lack of enforcement for payment of workers on Mechanical Turk, a lack of governance that works for the Turkers. I wanna read an excerpt from uh, an Atlantic article on Mechanical Turks, um, and the above is also from that same article. Erica, a woman who was interviewed who works as a Mechanical Turk. Her experience with Mechanical Turk is not an anom anomaly. A, published, uh, a research paper published in December that analyzed 3.8 million tasks on Mechanical Turk performed by almost 3,000 workers found that those workers earned a medium wage of about $2 an hour. Only 4% of workers on Mechanical Turk earned more than $7.25 an hour. So what is an ethical version of Mechanical Turk? What would it need? These are the first questions I asked myself. And then when continuing the project and researching the project, I asked what does it need, who uses it, and how does it harm? So then I started to ask these questions. What are the top countries that, uh, who, what are the top countries of people that are Turkers? It's the United States and India. Okay, what is the highest minimum wage in the US? What is the living wage in the US? Washington State has the highest minimum wage at $11.50 per hour, which is where Amazon is headquartered. So for the project, we're choosing Washington State as an artistic statement also as well as it just being the highest. According to a local newspaper in Seattle, a living wage should be around $15.92 or up to $16, and that includes Seattle. How often should people have breaks at work? In the US, according to a document put out by McDonald's, uh, that states that their employees are entitled to 30 minute breaks every four hours. None of these things are necessarily guaranteed at all for mechanical work or mechanical turkers because they are employees in a gig economy. They do not have paid breaks, no, nor do they have a guaranteed minimum wage. So these are the parameters for the calculator that we're building. This is sort of how we went through it. So what is a work day? Eight hours, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. We started to then think about how, would, how could we break down a remote work day. We start with eight hours. We started thinking that maybe at the top of every hour there should be a five minute break so someone could go to the bathroom. Um, if you work a remote job, you are chained to your laptop. It's very hard to sort of get up and do something, especially if you're paid per task. So, Eight times five is 40 minutes, so the work day actually is seven hours and 20 minutes, then with a 50 minute lunch break, which puts the paid work day at six hours and 30 minutes, meaning an hourly wage to account for uh, the time off so people are paid for their breaks must now be $19.60 per minute, that mean, or per hour. That means every task that someone does in an hour needs to add up to this. So what I'm trying to do is, uh, shift people's thinking away from tasks as isolated things or groups of tasks that only exist in their grouping, meaning instead of thinking a data model needs 10,000 tasks done to train, I'm trying to shift the thinking to have people think about 10,000 tasks would actually be X hours in X amount of uh, days in three or one or five people's working schedules. How do we shift the time away from tasks and shift it actually to uh, how long it would take someone to work? Um, so this is our parameters. 
And I believe that people should be paid for the work that they do. Uh, if you're working as a mechanical Turker, you should be paid a living wage. So which brings us back to these points. What is an ethical version of mechanical Turk? What would it need? Uh, what would make it feminist? And how do you make intersectional feminist AI? We need equity in pay, uh, recognition of labor, governance systems, accountability, and transparency in, in AI at every single step of creating with AI. It's not just about asking how the algorithm was made, though that should be deeply investigated, questioned, and interrogated from an ethical standpoint. But labor also needs to be at the forefront of this conversation as well. How can we make data collecting, data training, and data models more transparent? perhaps with labeling systems like nutrition labels, with dates of creation and tension, where it came from and who trained it and how much they were paid. How do we then make or show the labor in the data model? We need to analyze all tools and all steps in the AI pipeline. It's not just about the output, it's also what we're making and specifically how it's made. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Caroline. Uh, next up we have Sarah Grant. So Sarah's an American media artist and educator based here in Berlin. She holds a BA in Fine Art from UC Davis and an MA of Professional Studies in Media Art from NYU's Interactive Tele Telecommunications Program. She's a former research fellow at the Tau Center for Journalism at Columbia, adjunct professor at NYU Polytechnic in Digital Media, and artist in residence at IBEAM Art and Technology Center. With a focus on radio art and computer networking, she researches and develops open source software, artworks as educational tools, and workshops that demystify computer networking technology. She organizes the Radical Networks Conference in New York, New York and Berlin, which I'm sure many of you have been to, a community event and arts festival for critical investigations, social justice, and creative experiments in telecommunications. Thank you, Ruth. Um, yeah, so in my presentation, um, there's a lot of material. I mean, with 10 minutes, I'm going to basically give a um, summary of um, where on the networking level, um, there's the, the three main planes with which we interact when trying to get online um, on which injustices and disenfranchisements can um, occur. And, um, and I'm hoping that by the end of my 10 minutes, having just raised some questions and some provocations and some things to think about, we could discuss further about where these parallels we find um, we can identify between injustices happening in AI systems and the internet. So when it comes to using, using the internet, trying to get online, there's, there's three planes which I identify, I identify where injustices can occur. One is the control plane, which refers to basically the internet protocols. It's the back end, if you will, of the internet. Um, I'm a developer, so I'm sorry if I use <laughs> developer jargon like that, but um, it's, it's it's, it's, it's the plumbing, it's the infrastructure. Um, the second plane is the user plane. This is where we um, find user um, experience and user interface. Basically, it's the web, which runs on the internet. And then there's the access plane, which is uh, what controls how, whether we can get online whatsoever. Um, so in the control plane are the protocols, and um, a protocol is basically a set of rules which governs how two devices communicate with each other. I mean, this term applies outside of networking, but in the context of the internet, that's what it means. So like HTTP, TCP, IP, file transfer, FTP, um, email protocols, um, that's what a protocol is. And um, whether or not something is political, I mean, political action basically involves exerting control, um, organized control over a group of people. Um, it can also mean making decisions for the benefit of a specific group of people. So the question is, are protocols, are protocols political? And in which way are they? Um, so th I have this quote from RFC 8280. Um, RFC, in case you don't know, stands for Request for Comments. It's basically... Uh, where um, engineers um, submit proposals for new protocols or um, 
policies uh, with regards to the internet online and peers can review and leave their comments. Um, so we have um, in RFC 8280, this quote by Niels Ten Uver, um, the RFC is called Research into Human Rights Protocol Considerations. Whereas a specific technology might be a strong enabler of a specific human right, it might have an adverse impact on another human right. Um, maybe one example of this, which is more colloquial that we might be more familiar with, is the idea of freedom of speech protections in social media um, versus controlling the spread of misinformation and dealing with harassment online and how that's dealt with. Um, you know, those two things are sometimes at odds with each other, um, protecting freedom of speech while also protecting against harassment and abuse. Um, so when it comes to the internet, who, who if not controls, um, guides how internet protocols are developed? And that would be the um, Internet Engineering Task Force, who also, by the way, um, run the RFC um, program, I guess. But um, yeah, so I mean, while it's up to individual developers to decide how to implement the protocols and also software developers of applications, how to, um, which rely on, on the protocols to function, how to make use of, of the protocols, the IETF is, is responsible for setting the standards and best practices for how to develop the protocols themselves. Um, from their about page, the IETF is the premier internet standards body developing open standards through open processes. Um, anyone can actually join the, IE, the IETF. They have several working groups which, um, which address all the different aspects and areas and domains which go into developing internet protocols and governances. Um, ev everything from audio, vi audio video streaming to file transfer protocols to email protocols to security and so on. Um, there's thousands of members. But so yeah, so who actually controls the IETF? Um, that's the Internet en Engineering Steering Group. Um, they are the ones which, so for each working group, there's, there's a member from the IESG, um, which sort of directs the group. And if you look at who's, you know, in that group, it's, there's not a lot of community-based members. I mean, it's, um, I mean, there's supposed to be no conflict of interest. Uh, if you are part of the IESG, in fact, there's even an online um, conflict of interest form you're supposed to sign, which declare, where you declare that you will not allow conflict, conflict of interest to enter the work that you do on the IETF. But I mean, I mean, not to be cynical, but to be cynical, it's it's hard to trust that because these these are um, these are for-profit companies. You know, they're black boxes. So why should we trust that? Anyway. Um, I have a slide here in case anyone wanted to read a bit more about this stuff. You can take a picture of this, and these are some of the uh, um, some interesting RFCs which address human rights, actually, and ethics on the internet. Um, yeah. So um, the next plane is um, the user plane, where user experience and user interface. Uh, user interfaces are found. So UX, just in case anyone doesn't know, is is basically the presumed interaction model, the process a person, uh, which defines the process a person will experience when using a product or a website. And the UI is the actual interface. So the buttons, the, the navigation, the form fields, all, um, all that stuff. And um, And the thing we have to think about critically is does UX and UI always serve the the end user? Um, has it even been considered how to best, I mean, you know, has the actual end user been actually con, uh, considered? And if not, who is the UX and the UI actually serving? Um, I mean, sometimes it's, there's just bad, bad UX and UI, and I'm sure we've all encountered applications and web pages which we don't know how they work or how to use them whatsoever. And sometimes it's just sloppy, but sometimes it's, it's, very, in, it's very intentional in fact, and, and the interface is actually optimized for getting users to act online in, in ways which are not actually in their best interest. The internet is full of these so-called, whoops, dark patterns, and there we go. Sorry, I have this like annoying <laughs> window which will not leave me alone. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so the internet is full of these so-called dark patterns, which are designed explicitly to mislead or trick users to do things that they may not want, want to do. Um, there's this website called darkpatterns.org, which is a great resource, basically. Um, it's, it's like a repository defining all these different kinds of dark patterns which can be found online. And I, I picked just, just one out because, I mean, it, it's not funny, but the title is, you know, Privacy Zuckering, Trick into Sharing More Information About Yourself um, Online Than You Intended To. Um, and this refers to Facebook's reputation for making it difficult for users to control their privacy settings and generally making it very easy to overshare um, by uh, mistake. Um, but this happens also behind the interface, which is a lot of what Joanna Moll's work um, is addressing. Um, it, it has very much to um, do with the data brokerage market. And uh, I mean, basically, when you use an online service, often buried in the fine print is you giving permission for your data to be sold and exchanged among these data brokers. And it's just all very intentional that, that you don't find this or see this. Um, I mean, another example of a dark pattern, which I'm sure you've all seen, is when, uh, is when a window pops up and, and it asks you, do you want to do something? And it's not yes or no. It's either yes or I'll do it later. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck is that? Anyway, um, there, there's a really great essay called Weaponized Design by Kay Diem. Um, he originally published this in Our Data, Ourselves for Tactical Tech and also in winter of 2018 and also presented this at Radical Networks, um, the one that we had here in Berlin in 2018. And um, I really recommend you go onto our site, into the archives and look up his talk. We have all the talks um, taped and archived because it's, it's, it's great. But um, one quote from that is, weaponized design is a process that allows for harm of users within the defined bounds of a, de of a design system. And it's facilitated by practitioners who are oblivious to the politics of digital infrastructure or consider their design practice alpha to be apolitical. Um, here's a slide again if you wanted to um, uh, check out the essay or this site. So finally, this brings us to the access plane. And the question here asks is, who has access to the internet and at what cost? So um, uh, to give a story that it, that um, illustrates two sides of this coin. In 2017, Puerto Rico was devastated by a hurricane. And um, who came to the rescue to help restore communications networks, which were all knocked out, but, but Google's Project Loon. Does anyone here know about Project Loon? Or no? Well, I, I'm going to tell you about it anyway. <laughs> so, so basically, Project Loon made a deal with the government in cooperation with T-Mobile and AT&T to deploy a mobile network of balloons providing enough connectivity for 100,000 people below to engage in basic communications. Here's what one of the balloons looks like. Um, Project Loon is a, subsi a, a subsidiary of Alphabet, which is a Google company, and whose mission is to bring connectivity to, quote, unserved and underserved co communities, supplement existing networks, and provide expedient coverage after natural disasters, end quote. They've been deployed to Puerto Rico, as I'm showing, um, and recently to Kenya, and just this month to Peru to reach indigenous populations of over 200,000 people. It's basically a mobile cellular network supported by these balloons um, that hover 20 kilometers above the surface of, of the Earth. So, um, I mean, on the surface, it seems like this is a very altruistic and, uh, and, and nice gesture. But at the same time, it feels a bit exploitative that, um, that a company uh, that's very secretive and opaque about what it's doing um, should, ha should go in and rescue these, these, these vulnerable populations, um, rescue. And to quote a CNET um, article from, from September 2018, for companies like Google and Facebook, Facebook also has their own version of Project Loon. Um, getting more people online is good for business. Uh, there are still four billion people who aren't online. And the more people that come online, the more people, um, uh, the more people can, will use Google and Facebook. Because another term for these sorts of networks are, are um, is, is what, sorry? 
No, I, <laughs> I was going to say that um, that another term for these kinds of services is a walled garden. When 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 one service sort of brings you a network, you're you're walled into their garden. Therefore, they have a lot more control over what you can do within that space than if you were on the internet, as as we all know it. And so anyway, the more users that they have, the more valuable their ads become to marketers. So I mean, in the case of Project Loon, my questions are, you know, wh what do they do with the data that they could that they they collect from people who are using their um, networks, and is there an ability to opt out of whatever they're doing with the data? And how would they react to a community-based competitor? Would they actually support that effort, or would they um, try to shut it down? I mean, I guess the question is just if they really care about helping these communities and these and these vulnerable um, people in the face of disasters, like it, does that actually stand up? S Okay, um, so finally, uh, so okay, so what are the alternatives to um, this? Community networks, um, mesh and cellular. And here in Berlin, we have Freifunk. In um, in New York, I'll show a couple that we have there really quickly. Um, also, being able to self-host our own servers on our own hardware in our own homes, and peer-to-peer -peer networking protocols like DAT and IPFS, where basically. Um, everybody is is a node in in the greater network, and I mean we're all part of the network. Um, so there's no central point of control. So, in contrast to the Project Loon example, I wanted to talk about um, Red Hook Wi-Fi in Brooklyn, New York, which is a community-based um, network which was set up um, in 2011 as an effort to um, basically bring community network services to Red Hook, built by the people, for the people, and designed in cooperation with the people. So a very similar event happened in 2012. Hurricane Sandy dev devastated New York, and particularly this neighborhood, Red Hook, which basically sticks out into the ocean. Um, the communications networks were all knocked out. However, because they had previously set up this community mesh network, they were still able to communicate with each other. Um, I will jump ahead to this screen. So, uh, so yeah. So, like I said, the original reason why this network was was deployed was because this neighborhood is 70% public housing and people of color, and is fre was frequently targeted by the New York. Um, put, uh, Police um, and stopped and frisked. Which, if you do, if you've not heard about the stop and frisk program, it's basically in New York, a cop can stop you for any reason whatsoever and search your bag and search your person. So they, they want, they created an application to basically record these incidents. You know, just, just to, I guess, in some way, not just take it laying down, but uh, but start to keep like a public record of these incidents. Um, it all that they also deployed on the network a public bulletin board service so people could announce if they're doing shows or performances or whatever. As in public housing, you're not allowed to post those those kinds of things. So um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, I wanted to mention one more of these networks in New York: Hunts Point Free Wi-Fi, which um, we can talk more about in the discussion. Um, and We'll just end with um, this quote by Bintolda Waisaki, a bottom-up network architecture to meet the needs of communities rather than the top-down client-server relationship imposed upon most of the world states and data harvesting companies is the ideal network. So um, yeah, and there's some links for you to check out. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, do we have any questions? The lady with the hand up? I just wondered if you know of any networks like this going on in Europe. I'm sorry. Uh, of the networks, you talked about the two in Brooklyn, yeah. but um, are there any initiatives like that going on at this side of the pond that you know of? Yeah, Freifunk. And uh, I think. Was it, is it called Gifi, Gifi in, yeah. in Spain? So, so sorry, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so in Europe, three of the biggest networks are um, Freifunk here in Berlin and GifiNet in Barcelona. I always say GifiNet, but I guess that's not the correct pronunciation. Well, anyway, GifiNet. And then in um, Athens, Greece is the Athens Wireless Network. There's and also a consume in London. 
Oh, yes. Set up by James Stevens. I didn't even yes, know about yeah, this yeah. one. There you go. Great. <laughs> yeah. Was there another question behind? Yeah. There's also a big... Um, it used to be originally Wi-Fi based, but now there's also optical links and other other ways in the Czech Republic. It's called CZ3. Oh, cool. I mean, one of the things that we were talking about uh, beforehand was that there's a there's a really great uh, community mesh network program in Detroit at the moment, and that uh, it's it's developed alongside a kind of community education program. So it's not, it, it, you were kind of pointing at it with a Red Hook example. It's something that springs from complex needs of a community that sees itself together to develop new skills and to build infrastructure that isn't there as well. Yeah, and it also gives the opportunity for communities who are used to being surveyed, harassed, abused really, um, an opportunity to actually build something for themselves to sort of gain some sort of like self-created empowerment and control back over their communities and how they communicate with um, one another, you know. So it's, yeah, there's some community building aspects to this as well. And the other thing that I think is important about community networks is, I mean, it, it, it not saying that it's easy, but if you manage to organize one and deploy one, it allows you to opt out a lot of the bullshit we're all, you know, sub subjected to on on the internet. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess it drums home this the the kind of reality that the internet doesn't have to equal Facebook yeah. or Google. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Caroline, um, <laughs> to come back to your to come back to your presentation, so. You present AI like, like you're really introducing, you're putting the humans back in the middle of AI and reminding us that artificial intelligence is very dependent on human nurturing, basically, or, or the exploitation of some humans by other humans to make the AI seem incredibly intelligent. Um, so can, can we extrapolate from your kind of... Uh, if we have an intersectional feminist AI, say we get there, then what, what, does the, what, does, what new internets does that make possible? Or what new feminist realities does that make possible in the world? I mean, I guess this, this is sort of where the big reveal is like part of this project is very inherently speculative, right? Um, because, you know, the internet's still really carved up by Google. And, um, you know, even with the creation of this project, it doesn't, you know, necessarily fix Facebook or it doesn't improve, um, you know, like any of the working conditions uh, that, that exist in any of the major companies. Um, but I sort of present it as this provocation around if we're going to have deep conversations around what is ethical AI or how do you improve bias in AI. And we're only looking at things like, like as if we're only looking at what goes into a data model and how, how data is gathered and extracted, but not actually like the, the labor injustice that happens with, with training um, or the, the big companies tools we use. And like that is a very, that is like a missing part of this conversation. I think when I think about intersectional feminist internet, I think we have to take a major step back and also think about <clears throat> who funds even the open source tools that we use as well. For example, I'm funded by the Mozilla Foundation. The Mo Mozilla Foundation is funded by the Mozilla Corporation. The Mozilla Corporation receives some funding from Google. Um, in a tweet uh, earlier this week, Meredith Whitaker pointed out that even a lot of startups, um, the tools that they're using or the funding that they have, it comes from bigger companies. So like how many machine learning groups or, or machine learning startups use Google products, but not just like, I'm not talking about like G Suite, right? But like use like TensorFlow or using like pre-trained data models or are thinking about that, right? So like a much bigger thing we have to sort of look at, and I think this ties into Sarah's points very well, is like the tools, like what are the tools we're using? Who made them? Where did they come from? And in machine learning, that means like really looking at like who trained the data model, how many people, where do they come from, where did that data come from, how old is that data, right? Um, and then like 
what kind, like, who wrapped or condensed like the algorithm into a web API? Like, what happened there? What did it look like? How do we investigate that? Um, it's amazing that like so many machine learning tools are are easier now to use. That there are so many um, like more like more accessible technology around that, relatively speaking. Uh, like the Processing Foundation has made P5 JS, I think machine learn like ML, like they've made their own version of that, and that's amazing. But we still have to sort of look at like what what went into all of those tools, right? And so many of these tools are made by Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. And not, there's not a lot of insight really into them or how they're maintained. Um, that kind of brings us back to your very first slide, which is like, okay, we need to resign ourselves to the fact that society is led by technology. But hidden in that statement is the idea that there aren't humans behind the technology or humans ac acting and making decisions within the corporations that are making the decisions about the technology. And it feels like there's, a, there's this kind of, it's a classic Wizard of Oz kind yeah. of idea, basically. It's the spectacle of technology leading society to a kind of uh, glossy future. I mean, I, I think yes and I think no. I think that there's like a spirit in looking at artificial intelligence that reflects the spirit of like of open source and like Wi-Fi networks and communities. Mm -hmm. It's just taking like a more policy bent. Like there's like regulation is coming right now in the EU for machine learning. Um, it may take a while, but like there are like I think three bills that are touching on like transparency around data. That will like deeply affect regulation around machine learning. And I think regulation's only going to keep coming for something like artificial intelligence. And I, I, I'm interested to see like how that starts to change the tools that we use. Um, how does that sort of force transparency? I think we may end up in a situation that looks like GDPR where like the idea of the bill was really strong. Like this idea around um, being able to opt out of online advertising in a way on a website, but that GDPR is full of dark patterns, right? Like, and some of it's not even just implemented. Like, if you go to Fox News right now, they don't even, like, have... They're any. not hiding it. Yeah, they're just like, we don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is illegal, and we should all report them so they get, like, heavily fined. But, like, <laughs> they just but, don't... But the other thing that, yeah. that your model is pointing at is a kind of... Uh, it's, it's like a kind of de economic decelera deceleration as well. So it's not just the kind of hiding of the kind of tech before society, but it's yeah. also hiding the e economic kind of ide ideology at the heart of that as a vision. And so, so this whole thing kind of is rolling faster in the wrong direction. Totally, um, and again, this is where I, maybe I'm overly optimistic or overly hopeful, you know, working um, in, as a design researcher in more of the human rights space. Um, and maybe I'm too hopeful of like the European Parliament, maybe I shouldn't be, but this is where I am hopeful about like steps towards regulation around artificial intelligence in particular. Um, sadly, I don't see uh, labor enough of, of within that conversation at all, which is you know worryingly problematic, um, but at least there is regulation and calls for transparency around um, transparency around data models. Um, and like arguments around how people's own data are used within that. And I think that thread's really important. What, what could it look like? Is it possible to opt out of an algorithmic timeline or have your data removed in a way from, from being used by Facebook, right? What could that look like? And that is the future that I'm, I hope exists one day. And that's sort of like the vein of what this project is trying to touch on is like what are, small speculations that can exist as metaphors or examples, you know, that can... Help regulators. Just like <laughs> help, help regulators. or just like help people think about like how do you yeah. problem solve, right? Yeah. Um, and what are all the steps of the problem? Because, you know, even with, with when feminist data sets done, like I don't think that the data I'm collecting will, will have a lack of bias. It'll just have mm. a different kind of bias, yeah. right? I don't think the data model will be perfect. Um, and the output of the project may be really weird and wonky because like I'm collecting text, but I'm collecting text written by many different people and many different voices and many different constructs, like from poems to 
academic articles to blog posts to podcast transcripts, all of those are different data points, right? And have different data types to them. Like a poem is structured very differently than an essay. Mm -hmm. So even like the data set I'm creating is like also inherently a speculative data set. The output may be just very strange and, and weird. I, I would like to take questions from anybody that hasn't already asked a question. I think I see two hands up. Yes. Um, I want to bring Joanna Moll's comment into this conversation because she was describing something about how the data gets collected in these, in these, from these titan powers that are then profiting from all of this data. And it, it's, it's like we're experiencing a kind of a, a, a Fukushima of data at the moment. And I'm wondering why we're trying to think of alternative AI rather than questioning why do we, what do we, what do we need AI for our communities for? And the other thing is, is that if we, are we gonna fool ourselves into thinking that we're going to create these alternative local networks, but in the end that data is going to leak to the, to the titans. And so by collecting the data in the first place, we're creating something potentially like very disingenuous and, and problematic because that data is really something that is better used by these titan agendas which want to have massive automization of, of our lives. So, you know, should we be questioning also these approaches to alternative AI? Why, what are we trying to do with them uh, to, to better our communities and our connections with our communities? Uh, that, okay, that's a really lovely question, and I'm aware we have two minutes. Okay, and I, so can we take the other question, and then we'll try and give a meaningful answer. Um, I actually, I mean, who asked that question just now? Yeah, I'm, I think this is something that I wanted to touch upon, and also thinking about this space and how we also uh, how we discuss. Um, artificial intelligent traps um, and algorithms in also very secure spaces of um, data analysis, whereas um, there's, there's, there's a lot of people out there who are doing a similar kind of work or maybe different because there's so much at stake. And by so much at stake, I'm thinking about um, um, friends, uh, activists who, um, with whom I worked, who made a lot of our work as videographers and lawyers and so on possible because of their, uh, because of their amazing knowledge, but also because they took a lot of risks and some of them, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important, um, I really enjoyed the, the, your pres all the presentations tonight. Um, I learned a lot, and um, I just can't stop wondering how amazing it would be to have this kind of presentation right now in Egypt, and that's not really possible. And I, I sometimes feel that although we discuss a similar thing, we are also very much disconnected from one another. And I, I just wonder how can we bridge that, or maybe that's not really a possibility at the moment. I'm going to be naughty and have one more question here at the front. <laughs> if I can just add to previous two, uh, it's really just a comment uh, briefly. Considering uh, who we are and where we are and what is our potential agency in terms of cultural field or, or artistic practice, I feel like it's most of the time feels a bit like a waste of resources or at least a naive um, attempts of kind of counterbalancing these superpowers on the other side in fixing the issues around artificial intelligence, algorithms, rather than seeing what could we do as a, someone who can change the culture around the use rather than respond with another tech fix uh, or, or like hack to compensate. Okay. Um, 
a response from both of you to wrap yeah. up, please. Sure. So, uh, those, all those were really lovely questions, and I just want to highlight, you know, uh, there, it, there's only so much one can cover in a 10-minute presentation. Um, and so for me, it's important to highlight, like, I work as a design researcher on the human rights side as well as, like, working, maybe not working with companies, but, like, interrogating the uses that they have of artificial intelligence. Uh, I think most AI that e exists or AI startups are, are bullshit. Um, and a lot of it is tech for tech's sake. Um, but artificial intelligence is like electricity. It's just a thing. It's a really big kind of broad infrastructure that can be used for a variety of things. It is uh, overhyped, much like blockchain, um, and misused radically all the time. And I think the ways that it gets misused is because we don't talk enough about the different steps in the pipeline from a human rights angle. So where did your data come from? You need a lot of data for artificial intelligence. Did you consensually get that data? How old is it? How many, like, if it's about people, what population did it come from? What country? How old were those people in the data set? Did they consent to being in the data set? Then where are you using that data set to train a data model? Are you putting that into another context? If you are, that's problematic. You shouldn't do that. And I think like that's part of the like part of the art project I'm working on is a small art project that comes out of many years of research that I've done, like approaching this as like a design pipeline problem. And it is a pipeline issue. I don't think most uses of artificial intelligence need to use artificial intelligence, but it's important to look at everything and every step and look at like the gaps or the ways that it creates human rights problems and how those problems get amplified once it's also then created as as an algorithm or it's placed into like an API as a product, as a service, right, that people can purchase. Like that's, that's a big issue. Um, so for me, that's sort of the approach I take, which is why like uh, part of this project is also just thinking about um, how do you highlight again those that are not seen in the pipeline, those that are, are, are uh, benefiting the absolute least, in fact, or perhaps being harmed the most in the pipeline of this of this problem. How do you expose that part of that? I think you can use art to have this deeper conversation or as a, as a metaphor. Um, my opinion is basically I agree that all these systems are just broken and flawed, and I kind of feel like we should just burn it all down. But I think it's really good to... Um, <laughs> to uh, but I value the thinking and the sort of research um, and the projects that are happening like what Caroline's doing because if we do ever get to a point one day where we burn it all down and start over, we'll have a new place to start from. So I, I, I still see the value in, in this research you know, for, for that. And, and as far as it being a cultural problem, I totally agree with that. I mean, that's what, I mean, believe me, like I work, I do a lot of, I basically work in the domain of DIY networking, community networks, blah, blah, blah. And the thing is, like, I mean, I'm not under any sort of errors that this stuff is, um, though the potential's there, it's not. And, and in some places, like Barcelona or even here in Berlin, where it is pretty well um, adopted, both deploying and using these alternative networks, that's a very small segment of the population. And it, it totally is a cultural problem. And, I mean, it's a marketing problem and a usability problem. and um, I wish so much uh, that I could start an ad agency whose sole job was to like make these alternatives more, well, easier to use, and not only that, but like cool to use or sexy to use or whatever whatever it is that makes us that so that we can sell soda like sugar water, and, for, and that's like a billion dollar industry. You know, like we can do that. Like if there was uh, if there were if there was enough effort and money and time thrown at it, maybe we could do the same to make these alternatives more interesting. But until we get there, all we can do is keep trying to, um, to resist and make this information available for people who want to know it and, I don't know, not give up. <laughs> Even though it does indeed feel futile in the face of these giants. I mean, this is my life. I know, it's very depressing. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was brilliant. <laughs>
now follow up and conclude the, the uh, conference of today because uh, it's also the last uh, conference that uh, we will do this year, at least here at uh, Betanian. Yeah. Uh, but uh, w there will be still a follow up of this conference as part of the uh, meetups program. Uh, so now we are going to introduce a bit what comes next. Uh, and so we will also f uh, finish the year program at, at uh, Studio One in a nice way that we will explain yes. later. So we will keep up with the good tradition of our activation community program of also doing an event following on each conference. So we're actually <laughs> going to have a next event on the Friday the 6th of December, which is already next week. And it's called Disrupt the System, Not the Climate. And in this event, we're going to talk about surveillance, climate change, and global conflict. So this will be happening at Akut, Akut Magnoi in uh, Berlin Mitte. Uh, and we're very excited about it because we invited some really great groups to talk there about their work. So there will be the Berlin-based collective Digitale Freiheit. And they will be speaking about their counter surveillance techniques and also the right to privacy. Uh, then there will be the Australian journalist and open source intelligence researcher Michael Cruikshank from Australia. And he will talk uh, about and also give us a short workshop about open source intelligence and how climate change is intertwined with political conflicts. And finally, this is what we're actually super excited about as well, that we will have the privacy electropunk band System Upsturts and they will do a live performance at the end. Great. And so, <laughs> yes. So come on next Friday. Yes. Uh, so it's not finished yet. So we hope to see you there at Akud. That is yeah. also a new venue for us for doing this event. And so also we wanted to anticipate what we are going to do next year. So people don't leave because you are going <laughs> to miss this wonderful uh, surprise. <laughs> Um, so, actually, I also wanted to say that we should thank uh, the Senatsverwaltung für Kultur und Europa, that translated into English is the Senate Department for Culture and Europe, uh, because uh, we got uh, a grant of uh, four years from 2020 until 2023. So that is why we are able to speak about <laughs> what happens next year, so we can plan ahead. And actually, we should plan also until 2023, but yes. I mean, we will go there. So um, what is going to happen next year is, again, we will do uh, four conferences. So it will be the same concept that we are applying now. There will be three uh, thematic conferences and the one community conference at the end of the year, like the one of today that is uh, connecting to the different conferences that we did uh, in the year. And we will start uh, end of March with a conference about uh, real estate offshore and uh, the financial investment in the property business uh, connected to tax haven. So this is a very important subject here in Berlin because I think we are also in the middle of this. And uh, we will go uh, right, uh, again uh, uh, into this subject together with the Transparency International and also Transparency Deutschland. Uh, so this will be the way we start. Uh, then uh, we will have a conference uh, middle May uh, related to the discourse of migration, border controls and also the stigmatization of migrants uh, in this political framework related also to closure of borders and the surveillance. Um, we never touched for until now this subject at the Disruption Lab and we think it's very important to consider so we want to do this uh, as a second conference and the third one uh, will be in a sense connected with this discourse that we had today also related to the discourse of digitalization smart cities ai uh, in particular we want to go into the discourse of urban planning for the cities of the future and also connected to the smart cities and we will uh, work again with an investigative journalist from Italy that is called Mauro Mondello that was also curating with me uh, the conference we did in 2017 about the media propaganda of ISIS. So we are going to work again together and this will be what happens in September. 
and then we will have again the community conference in November. So yes, yeah, you noticed today it was a very packed program which we tried to squeeze into one day. So next year we will have two days for this. And we will also keep doing regular meetups. So each time for each conference there will be a meetup before and afterwards where we also connect with Berlin-based communities and initiatives that work on the same topic. And this will all result in the final conference of the year which is the community conference. And so now, finally, we want to start with the thanking and also thanks all of you that stay until now to listen to us. And uh, I would like to call on stage, uh, on stage that we don't have, I mean, is without stage today, but uh, I mean, it's still whatever space of discussion. Um, but uh, uh, so I want to call on uh, here at, uh, Nada Bakker that has been working with uh, Lieke for the community program and also with me for the conference program and also Monty Harmony, the project manager, come on the non-stage. <laughs> We want uh, also to involve here with us Jonas Franchi that never came before. Oh, actually, yes, here he came. And also he gets his flowers. Uh, Jonas is uh, the creator of all our graphic and animation that you constantly see here. And also uh, we want to welcome Kim Sanu that has been working with uh, Monty Harmony on the discourse uh, and program of managing the conferences. <laughs> but come, come closer to me, otherwise you don't enter in the video, so there is... <laughs> we are not all on... Um, and uh, after this, uh, I would like... Uh, yes. Um, I want uh, also to call Giacomo Marin Salta that worked uh, on the press uh, and communication. <laughs> so this has been the core team that worked uh, with us uh, this year to produce all these conferences, but there are also other people that work with us at the conferences and during the year that we want to thank. Uh, one is uh, Lauren De Carli that is sitting there and has been very helpful for many uh, events at the Disruption Lab, both with his editing work and also organizing with us the Strassenfest. So thank you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> and so we want to thank our video crew, Gonzalo, Gabriel, and Hel, uh, the streaming uh, Boiling Heads. Uh, and Maria Silvano, our photographer. <laughs> and Paolo Combes, uh, Thorsten uh, uh, Otken, that have been working on the technology support. <laughs> and also I want to thank Elisabeth Enke, that is not here with us today, because there is Paolo, but she has been working with all the sounds, uh, technology, since the beginning of the Disruption Lab. <laughs> and finally, the cash desk uh, supporter Lino uh, and the helper that have been building up the space with us, Guglielmo and Rob, thanks a lot. And finally, I want to work the co-director of the... Uh, I, want to, I want to thank... Uh, this is an interesting lapsus. We have been working too much. Yes, yes I want to thank <laughs> the co-director of the Disruption Lab, Lieke Plucher, and thanks for her wonderful work. Here is the word of this year. And also thanks to my co-director, which is Tatiana Batticelli, for the amazing collaboration. <laughs> So thanks everybody, thank you, great team, and so we will meet all to celebrate the final uh, event of the year at Akut, the 6th of December, otherwise we will be back here in March, and please come both in December and in the future. Thank you. Thank you.